All right. Well, good afternoon. Good evening. Welcome to Steeplest Church. We are glad that you are with us. Uh, we're going to be starting a little bit differently tonight. Honestly, we have so much good stuff that I wanted to uh, talk about tonight that we really didn't have time to start with music. Um, so I apologize for that, but uh, I hope that you'll enjoy uh, what we are going to cover instead, and we will consider this a time of worship. I would sing a joyful noise to the Lord, but you probably wouldn't think it sounded very joyful. So I'm going to pass on that, and I'm going to go... Uh, uh, straight away and start talking about what we're gonna what we're gonna do tonight. Uh, first of all, if you have not been with us before, or if you've not engaged with us in conversation during our Zoom before, please use the chat feature to do that. There's I see there's already at least one chat in the queue. Um, you will find all kinds of notes there. You will find chat between different members of the uh, um, audience as well as us back here. And we would just love to converse with you via the chat feature on Zoom. We have some really cool announcements tonight. Um, and I want to go over these, uh, you know, kind of independently and bring you up to speed. The first one is we are excited that our SBTC affiliation is official. If you're not familiar with the SBTC, that is the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention. Um, we are a Baptist church. Uh, the cool thing about Baptists is we don't fall under anyone's like um, uh, direction, if you would. Uh, while we agree that we believe certain things about the Bible, the, the the Southern Baptist Convention does not tell us what to teach, how to teach it, anything like that. Uh, we're actually extremely independent. Um, the cool thing about being an affiliate member of the SBTC is that they give us a 501c3 covering until we have our own 501c3. That's your tax exempt status. Um, currently, the government is telling us that it can take up to three years for that status to be finalized. So we've submitted all of our paperwork. We've done all the things we're supposed to do, but the feds are telling us it could be three years before we actually become a 501c3. So how does that affect you? The cool thing is, is that with the SBTC covering we now have, there's no question, there's no worries when you give to Steeplelist that it's tax exempt. Um, you don't need to worry about it. We don't need to worry about it. We're protected. Um, so that's pretty exciting for us because we don't have to worry about any of that. Um, not to mention they have a whole bunch of really cool resources for us to use if we want to. Um, so, so that's pretty exciting. We are, we are glad about that. Now there's, um, there's, there's nothing for us to worry about in terms of the 501c3. And for those of you who have already been giving to Steeplelist, we just want to say thank you again. Um, and you are 100% covered under your tax exempt status. All right. The second thing I want to talk about, and I'm actually going to change slides here um we're, for a second we're going to talk about the weekly bible study and then we're going to talk about rosh hashanah so <clears throat> every week now we will have a bible study available for you to participate in during the week and as you know if you've been with us we've been studying the book of acts in church the bible studies however will not follow acts they'll be on totally separate topics so, for example, the first week we uh, we put a Bible study up, a weekly Bible study. It was on the Holy Spirit. The second week uh, was on sanctification. This week, uh, we're, we're going to watch a piece of a video here uh, about this week's Bible study. But the cool thing is, um, I want you to know that these studies are really good. So, John Jr., our associate pastor, he'll be the the ones leading these Bible studies. Uh, we're, we're also excited to announce that each week there will be an actual Bible study time on Zoom that you can engage in the Bible study. Even if you didn't do it during the week, you can engage with us during the week. Um, but you can download these well in advance. You can study up, that sort of thing. But what I want to do right now is play a video just to give you a taste of what this week's Bible study looks like.
If you know any Christians, or if you happen to be one, you've probably heard the word gospel as a kind of summary of Christian belief, connected to phrases like, God loves you, or Jesus died for your sins. But over time, religious words like gospel can lose their power and meaning by becoming too familiar. So let's take a moment to rediscover what this important word, gospel, meant to the people who wrote the Bible. Gospel translates the Old Testament Hebrew verb, beser, and the noun, besora. The Greek New Testament equivalent is euangelion, which is a compound word. Eu means good, and angelion means announcement. All of these words mean good news, but what kind of news? Well, in Hebrew, beser is what we might call national news, or a royal announcement. Like when King David hears the messenger Beser that his army was victorious in battle, that means he still rules on his throne over the people of Israel. And after David dies, his throne is passed on to Solomon, his son. And when he was inaugurated as king in Jerusalem, a herald spreads the Besorah, that a new ruler is in charge. But after Solomon's death came a bunch of bad news kings whose corruption led their nation into self-destruction. This is why the prophet Isaiah announced the good news that one day the God of Israel would come as the cosmic king to confront all corrupt and violent kingdoms and restore for his rule over all nations. And so, when Jesus of Nazareth hit the public stage, he continued Isaiah's gospel when he went around announcing the euangelion of God's kingdom. Jesus claimed that God was restoring his reign over his people, Israel, and over all nations, and he was the one bringing it all about. Now, the euangelion about a new king in charge means a new way of life. Jesus said that living in God's kingdom meant following him by putting down the sword and seeking peace through radical forgiveness and generosity, even toward your enemies. His good news required you to make a decision. This is why Jesus took his euangelion to Jerusalem to confront the corrupt and violent kingdoms of his day. But he challenged them in a surprising way with the power of God's generous love. As Jesus was being executed by his enemies, he received his crown and was mocked as a fake king. But he displayed true royal authority by forgiving his tormentors. Jesus was the one in charge that day, giving his life for the sins of others. And then, a few days later, everything changed. Jesus rose from the dead as the true king, whose love is stronger than death. He appeared to hundreds of his followers and told them to spread the euangelion, that all authority in heaven on earth now belongs to him. And they did share this good news all over the ancient world. They did it by writing the four accounts of Jesus' life that are the gospel. That is, they tell the story of how Jesus brought God's kingdom, how he lived for others and died for their sins, and then was raised from the dead. Jesus' followers also shared the good news by simply talking about it. This is why Peter and Paul, or Priscilla and Aquila, traveled all around sharing the royal announcement. While it might look like the rulers of our world are in charge and can do whatever they want, the good news is that the crucified and risen Jesus is the true Lord of the world, the real king of all creation. And in Jesus' kingdom, things are different. It's where the real leaders are the servants, because the last are first, and the first go to the back of the line. It's where the hungry are fed and the homeless are welcome, because love is the most powerful reality of God's kingdom. And this good news is not easy to believe. It actually sounds kind of crazy when you first hear it. But something happens when people tell the story of Jesus and start living like he really is the king of the world. That's when this gospel becomes the best news that you've ever heard. All right. So uh, that video we just watched does not tie in with today's lesson. Uh, or tonight's sermon, but I did want to give you an idea of the quality of uh, the lessons that will be available during the week. So uh, this coming Thursday at 7 p.m. Central Time, which would be 5 o'clock on the West Coast, 8 o'clock on the East Coast, we will have our very first Bible study meeting during the week. Um, so I just want to give you a heads up. These are these are really cool. Some of these are, uh, are Bible study topics that John has gone out and found 
uh, from really reliable sources. Some are Bible studies that he's written himself. But in both cases, you'll have quality material that's been vetted, that you know is true, uh, that you know is accurate to the Word of God, and that you can be confident in. So we are excited about our Bible study series, uh, and we hope that you will join us this week, Thursday, 7 p.m. Central, for our very first study. All right. The next thing I want to talk about is Rosh Hashanah. So today is actually the first day of Rosh Hashanah. And um, before we start talking about what that is, I'm going to play a very short video. This one's way shorter than the last one. Uh, it's like 30, 40 seconds long. It's actually a, a quick little loop, but I wanted to just show you uh, what this looks like that I'm going to be talking about. All right, quick little video. All right, so today is the first day of Rosh Hashanah, also known as the Feast of Trumpets. Officially, it is the beginning of the Jewish New Year. Uh, one of the coolest traditions that happens today for those who are Jewish is that they eat apples that are dipped in honey. And it's a really cool tradition that stems from Genesis 27, 27. Uh, in that passage, Isaac was passing on the blessing to his son. And in verse 27, he says, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field, which the Lord has blessed. And the Talmud identifies the field in this verse as an apple orchard. Now, I don't have time to get into a, a detailed explanation of what the Talmud is, but generally it is a collection of writings designed to help explain Judaism to Jewish followers, okay? So on this day, Jews take apples and they dip them in honey, and that honey represents sweetness. And the concept is really this, may this new year be the sweetest year yet which I think is a pretty cool uh, symbol. But the Feast of Trumpets also has some other interesting names. It is also called the Day of Awakening Blast, the Day of Resurrection, the Day of Remembrance, and the Day of Coronation of the King. And what's so interesting to me about these names is that they all allude to the coming of the Messiah. And Jesus, of course, is the Messiah. So what about this horn trumpet thing? We just watched that little video. Well, that horn is a shofar. Uh, it's actually the horn of an animal. There's a short version uh, that comes from a ram. And the long version, like in the video you just watched, actually comes from an antelope called a kudu. Um, and they use this horn to signify four very specific things on this day. So they actually blow this horn at different times during the day uh, in different ways. And those, those horn soundings mean different things. Uh, the first of the four is a three second sustained note that signifies the coronation of the king. You see, Rosh Hashanah is a day of appreciating who God is. And for us who know Messiah, it's a day of appreciating who Jesus is. So a Jew would tell you that God is the creator. God is all-powerful. God is sustainer. God is supervisor. And in short, God is the king of the universe. So this trumpet blast reminds us to stop and just realize who God is. The second trumpet, which comes later in the day, is three wailing blasts, and it almost sounds like crying. And these three blasts signify a broken heart, and they remind us of our brokenness, and that this blast is a call for us to repent. In other words, we, we first we realize who God is, and now it's a time to remember who we are. 
and we are broken and we need to get ourselves right with God. Later in the day, there is a third sounding, and this is a nine blast uh, alarm, if you would. So nine short blasts from this horn. And the significance is we need to be alert and we need to be paying attention because the king is coming. And the fourth trumpet at the end of the day is one last call to repentance before the great day of the Lord, the king's arrival. We, of course, know that the king has arrived. So in conclusion, Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah uh, has a direct reference to the book of life uh, in which the names of the righteous are written. And as Christians, we know that our names are written in Jesus' book of life and that we are secure in our eternity if we have faith in him. So I invite you, grab some apples and some honey, and may this year be your sweetest year yet. All right, on to our lesson. We uh, will be starting shortly. We'll be in Acts chapter 15. We'll be looking at the first 35 verses. We're going to cover a lot of ground. Um, and, the, and the name of today's sermon is It Shouldn't Be That Hard. Uh, so, uh, Gina, if you're with us, if you could pray us in, that would be absolutely fantastic. Lord, we bless your name. We, we lift your name on high. And God, we bless Rosh Hashanah and this uh, Jewish feast, God. And may there be peace in Israel and protection, God, for your people, the Jews. And Lord, we pray, God, right now uh, for the anointing of your Holy Spirit to come and uh, to minister through Johnny and may there be ears to hear and eyes to see the truth in your words. And I lift up Sam, Regina and her family, Donna and Francis for the continued healing from the COVID. And I thank you God for the work that you've begun that you will finish the good work that you have begun in the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. All right, thank you, Gina. All right. So as we start into chapter 15, uh, um, the story has shifted again. Last week, of course, uh, we finished up Paul's first missionary journey, uh, and now we kind of shift and the story turns to Jerusalem. And what we're going to look at is um, what happens when a, a controversy has caused discord between believers. So starting here in, in verse 1. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. Okay. So, before we even get uh, kind of started by, you know, with, with getting into all the details here, I want to, to cover some first, you know, some kind of background here. First of all, from a general point of view, whenever we get a group of two or more people together, there will be contention. There will be dispute, even in the church. Some would say, uh, especially in the church. And for any of you who are interested in church leadership, or, or quite frankly, even being a volunteer, this is just a reality we need to be aware of. And it's not actually a bad thing. You see, the important thing is not to avoid disagreement and conflict. The important thing is rather how we handle it and what the end result of our conflict is. Second, from a more specific point of view, this particular argument, this conflict had already been addressed about 10 years earlier by the church. So just to kind of put you on the timeline, we are, well, by the time we get to Acts chapter 15, we're roughly 20 years past Jesus' um, dying, res being resurrected, and ascending to heaven, okay? So almost 20 years have passed. 
And about 10 years earlier on the actual timeline, for us, it was Acts chapter 10 and 11, uh, a couple of months ago, we learned about Peter first preaching to the Gentiles. And when he did that, if you remember Peter's encounter with Cornelius the Centurion, that story included the information that the Holy Spirit had descended on the household of Cornelius, um, and all of them had re received the Holy Spirit, okay? And if you, so if you remember that story, Peter had been uh, invited, let's just say that, it's, uh, we, we can't tell the whole story over, but Peter had been invited to the home of Cornelius. Uh, Cornelius had invited his friends and family. Um, Peter preached the gospel. They accepted Christ, and the Holy Spirit descended on all of them. So the issue of what was necessary to be saved had already been addressed by the church, all right? It was already clear that salvation is through faith in Jesus, okay? And while that faith... <clears throat> will be, and, and, and while that faith will be proven sincere to us and to others by the actions we take after receiving God's grace, it is the act of faith itself that saves, not works, okay? So that had already been established. Third, it was relevant that the people preaching circumcision were from Judea, okay? Did you, I don't know if you caught that or not, but right in, in verse 1, it says certain people came down from Judea to Antioch. And them being from Judea was significant because Judea is where Jerusalem is. That was Christian headquarters, okay? So anyone coming from Judea would, would be considered authoritative. The message they were carrying would have had extra weight, all right? So <clears throat> it's not surprising that the believers in Antioch took their message very seriously because they were from Judea, okay? They were, they were from the capital. They were from headquarters, at least geographically, all right? I think it's also important to understand the thinking behind the concept of circumcision itself. If we're to understand and why these believers were telling people to be circumcised, in Judaism, circumcision was an outward sign of being a son of the covenant. For example, for a non-Jew to convert to Judaism, right? You didn't just go in, you know, uh, pray a prayer or something, and you're a Jew. That's not how it worked. You first had to learn a great deal about Mosaic law, that is, the law of Moses. You had to learn a ton of stuff and then get tested on it okay and after you pass all your tests then you would be baptized now we don't have time to get into it it was actually a different kind of baptism from a christian baptism but you would get baptized and then and only then would you get circumcised after circumcision you would be considered a true son of the covenant you would have to go through all of this to kind of prove your sincerity to your conversion okay so to these preaching circumcision their position was how can someone appreciate the meaning of the new covenant if they have not experienced the old covenant all right the new covenant is what we have in jesus the old covenant was through the law of moses all right also and this is really what was tripping them up how could someone enter the kingdom of God so easily simply by professing faith? How could that be? All right. Didn't there need to be some demonstration of sincerity uh, to be a part of the family of God? From their point of view, that's what they were saying. And in a way, I can kind of see where they're coming from, or at least understand why they believed what they believed. Okay. Essentially, they were saying, how can a Gentile become a Christian if he does not first become a Jew, right? Jesus was Jewish. We're all Jewish. How could a Gentile become a Christian if he doesn't first become a Jew? And that leads me to my first question for you to consider for the evening. 
If you were told before you were saved, okay, if you were told before you were saved that to become a Christian, that you would first need to go, go through all the steps of becoming a Jew, including circumcision, would you have done it? Something to think about. All right, so how did the Christian leaders respond to this argument? You notice verse 2 says that this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. Now, I think there's a really important observation we need to make about this verse. Paul and Barnabas did not simply tell them, you're wrong. Quit preaching circumcision. We're right. Zip it. Technically, they could have. Like I said, uh, and, and as they knew, this issue had already been settled a decade earlier. But instead... Paul and Barnabas debated with them. And when that was unsuccessful, when they were not able to change the minds of these particular people who were preaching circumcision, they invited them to visit the church leadership in Jerusalem to settle the issue. They had a dialogue, okay? And it may have been a sharp dialogue, but there was a conversation, not just a rebuking. Which leads me to my second question tonight for you to consider. When you encounter another believer who believes differently than you do on non-essential doctrine, that is doctrine that does not impact salvation, are you more likely to fight for unity or create division? Something to think about. When you have a disagreement with another Christian, and the topic is non-essential doctrine. In other words, whether some be someone believes the way you do or whether the way the other person does, no one's going to hell over the issue, okay? Are you more likely to fight for unity or create division? All right, so moving on in the story. Paul, Barnabas, and these other believers, they head off for Jerusalem, as do the believers who were preaching circum circumcision, but they don't travel together, okay? They're in separate groups. And as Paul's group moves through Phoenicia and Samaria, the, the geographies between Antioch and Jerusalem, they tell the Christians of Jewish origin, origin how all the Gentiles have been converted, which encouraged the, the believers in all those places. In other words, they were, as they went, they were telling all of these previously Jewish Christians, okay, people who were brought up Jewish and were now followers of Jesus, they believed in their Messiah, about all the fantastic things that had happened with the Gentiles coming to faith as well, and it encouraged all the Christians as they went. So when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church, they are welcomed by the apostles and the elders, and, and this reference to apostles is to the original 12, or what was left of them, um, and some of them were still there, uh, and some of them were gone, so some of the apostles had already left uh, Jerusalem on missionary journeys of their own, but Peter, likely to provide theological uh, guidance, had stayed behind. He was headquartered at this time in Jerusalem, and likely John was as well. Of course, John had uh, been given care of Mary, Jesus' mother. Uh, so John's likely in town for this meeting as well. Uh, and some this this meeting that happens, by the way, is often referred to as the Council of Jerusalem. So verse five says, then some of the believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. Right now, I don't know if you caught that, but we just heard something very, very important. 
about these believers who were preaching circumcision. Circ I, that word is a tongue twister. Circumcision. They were believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees. All right. Now, first of all, I want you to see that they were believers. These are Christians. Okay. These aren't non believing Pharisees like the Pharisees that um, murdered Jesus. Right. These are Pharisees who have come to faith in Jesus. These are true believers. Okay. But we also find out that they are from the party of the Pharisees. Now, that's important because this is the group, obviously, that had been in power when Jesus was murdered. Um, and this was the Jewish group that had been overzealous about the law to the point where they didn't think God had given them enough rules and they made up hundreds of extra ones. Okay. So this was a group that was so sidetracked, honestly by the law, that that's all they focused on. So it's really not surprising that they were struggling with the idea that these new believers didn't have to follow the law, okay? And that's really what was tripping them up. The truth is that salvation had never been achievable just by keeping the rules. Um, God has always judged men based on their hearts, even long before Jesus walked on the earth. I want you to listen now to Hebrews 11, verses 8 through 12. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, as he and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. If you would have asked a Pharisee on what basis Abraham would enter heaven, they would have said, likely, his obedience to God and the law of Moses was his salvation. In other words, his works saved him because he followed the rules he would have been saved and this was what kept tripping them up but jesus speaking through the author of hebrews tells us something very different abraham was saved by his faith jesus spoke through paul in romans uh verse uh, chapter 4 verses 1 through 3 this way what then we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter. If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So here, Paul is affirming what we just read in Hebrews. Abraham was saved by his faith. He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And the word righteousness here means to be right with God. And his being right with God did not have anything to do with what Abraham did. It had to do with what Abraham believed, okay? And that's really important. And it was Abraham's belief, his faith that then compelled him to do what he did. Which leads me to my next question for you to consider. When you do good works, do you do good works out of duty or because you want to gain favor with God? Or is it because you are truly grateful for your new life?
something to think about. You'll have to examine your own heart on that one. All right, so back to our story here. The men preaching circumcision had told their point of view. And then the scripture goes on to tell us that the apostles and elders met to consider this question. Which leads us to verses 7 through 11. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my, my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have ever been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. All right, first notice right in the beginning of verse 7, there was much discussion. All right, the elders and the apostles did not just blow off their Pharisaic brothers. All right, they showed them dignity by letting them be heard and discussing the matter. All right, so by the time we get here, there has been a whole bunch of discussion, there's been a whole bunch of conversation. Um, between the two parties and everyone involved. Then we see uh, Peter referencing the situation I referred to earlier with Cornelius, okay? Uh, part of that story was that Peter had had a vision from God about what was clean and what was unclean. I don't know if you remember that vision, the blanket came down and there were all the animals on it. And if you, if you haven't, uh, if you don't remember that story, uh, go to our website. You can go back. You can find uh, Acts chapter 10 and 11. Watch those sermons. It's actually a, a fascinating story, and it's, it's very relevant to us as Gentiles. So um, here Peter is referencing that same story I referenced earlier. When Peter preached the word to those in Cornelius' home, they believed and had received the Holy Spirit. And as it pertains to the Gentiles, Peter says, what God has cleansed, let no longer, no longer consider unholy. That's Acts chapter 10, verse 15. All right. This can be a little bit confusing, so let me sum it up. Peter is saying, if God gave the Gentiles the Holy Spirit and required nothing other than faith, then who are we to require more of the Gentiles than God does? All right. Does that make sense? Who are we to require more of the Gentiles than God requires? So if God does not require Gentiles to be circumcised, neither should we. You know, this is the beauty of the new covenant with God through Jesus. The old covenant has been fulfilled by Jesus. The new covenant is ours through faith in Jesus and our works will be the outworking of our faith. As Jesus said in Matthew eleven thirty, 30, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. The yoke of the law, the burden of keeping the law, was incredibly hard to the point that here we see the apostles saying, you know, we couldn't do it. Our ancestors couldn't do it. Why are we trying to make the Gentiles do it? So now Peter steps down, and Paul and Barnabas testify about all the signs and wonders that God had done through them with the Gentiles. Um, and when Paul and Barnabas were finished speaking, James, the half-brother of Jesus, who is now the leader of the church in Jerusalem, takes the floor. And this is what he says. He says, brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The word of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written. 
After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild, and I will restore it, that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things, things known from long ago. And we find ourselves in verse 19. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every seven. Okay. So James makes a decision. He tells the group that they need to write to the believers and tell them that salvation comes from faith alone and that they will not burden them with extra conditions like circumcision. But at first glance, it seems that James has added some restrictions of his own, doesn't it? Um, he says, hey, tell them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. So what is this about? Isn't this just like the circumcision issue? It isn't. So, and our first clue to that is in verse 21 where he says, for the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Now, we need to catch this because it's very important. Remember who James is addressing, the Gentiles, okay? And the context of his statement, bringing the good news to Jews, Sorry about the uh, about the uh, break in the action there. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we didn't miss too much in the process. And all right, I'm gonna get back to where I was. Hopefully, hopefully we're in the same place. Uh, <clears throat> so again, I apologize. Uh, everything went down here, got black for a moment, but now we are back. All right. So what I was saying is that what's really happening here uh, in verse 20, 21 is really important. The law of Moses had been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath, okay? So we really need to catch this because it is important. James uh, is addressing the Gentiles, and the context of his statement is bringing the good news to Jews. So this is what James is saying. Gentile Christians, when you witness to Jews, abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. Why? Okay, this is important. Why would they do that? Because Jews are revolted by those things. They have been taught their whole lives to avoid those things. If you Gentiles do those things, then the Jews will be revolted by you and could miss the good news about Jesus because they are focused on your behavior. Remember when Paul said in 1 Corinthians 8, verses 9 through 18, and I'm just going to paraphrase it, I'm free to eat. The, the meat of animals sacrificed to idols, but I choose not to because it might cause a brother to stumble. This is exactly the same concept James is referring to here, all right? So then the apostles and the elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas called Bersabbas, and Silas, men who were leaders among them and among the believers. All right, so wisdom kicks in here, and what happens is the church decides, hey, they need to send a delegation back to Antioch to tell the Christians what the council has decided. 
they don't just send Paul and Barnabas. Because see, the, the people in Antioch already know the position of Paul and Barnabas. They already know what they think about it. Um, that's why they also send Silas, who's a Roman citizen, and Judas, because they're both leaders in Jerusalem. That way, those in Antioch would know that this delegation is both official and that the conclusion, the conclusion of the council was unanimous. All right. Now, let's see what that letter said. With them, they sent the following letter the apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Sicilia. Greetings. We have heard that some of you, <clears throat> some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends, Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. Okay. Notice the end of verse 29. You will do well to avoid these things. It does not say you will be saved if you do these things. All right. To abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality are things to be avoided if you want to have a good witness before Jews. Now, this leads me for, to two questions for you to consider tonight. Is there a behavior or a lifestyle that you engage in that causes others to stumble? And the second question is, would you be willing to abstain from it in order to be a better witness for Jesus? All right, Luke then records the conclusion to this passage. So the men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. After spending some time there, they were sent off by the believers with the blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. All right, I love this passage of scripture for both its theological richness. Uh, for example, verse 33, uh, in verse 33, Luke records, after spending some time there, uh, the word Luke used here for spending some time is actually a very colorful one that means to leave a mark. Wouldn't it be great if people said that about us? that when we spent time with them, we left a mark. Uh, I also love this passage because it is written directly for us Gentiles, okay? We are the intended audience for this scripture. So look, here is what I really want you to get from tonight's message. Under the old covenant between God and his chosen people, the Jews, there were many things that the Jews were commanded to do. The Jews had to learn the law of Moses. The Jews had to tithe 10% of their income. Well, actually, it was more than that, but that's a topic for another day. The Jews had to observe Rosh Hashanah and the other feasts. The Jews had to avoid certain foods. The Jews had to observe the Sabbath. That was all part of the old covenant. But we are no longer bound by all of that law. We Gentiles have been adopted into the family of God, and we got to skip all the have-tos. 
but too often that freedom brings misunderstanding. You see, we don't have to observe the Sabbath because we are now part of the family of God. We are invited to observe the Sabbath. And I could easily do an entire sermon just talking about how the Sabbath has improved my own life. All right, I don't have to learn Mosaic law, but I am invited to learn about our family history and celebrate the way God has poured out his love on his children. I don't have to celebrate Rosh Hashanah, but I am invited to celebrate the coming of Messiah Jesus. I don't have to tithe a specific percentage of my income to the local church, but I am invited to generously share the resources that God has given me with my Christian brothers and sisters. I don't have to change my lifestyle to keep unbelievers and new believers from stumbling, but because I am a child of God, I am invited to self-sacrifice those things and show honor to Jesus, who died on a cross for my freedom. In short, brothers and sisters, don't miss the opportunity to fully engage in all the blessings that God pours out on his children. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you that you have accepted us into your family, and we didn't have to prove ourselves by doing certain things. Lord, so many before us were bound by the law, and we're not. But Lord, we are indebted to your son Jesus for the sacrifice he made on that cross. Lord, let us never forget. Let us take communion and take the Lord's Supper with you every day in our own hearts, and remember what you have done for us. Lord, let us be so thankful that we would be a part of all the richness that you have invited us to. And Lord, I pray that when we spend time with others, that we would leave a mark, that people would remember not who we were, but how we showed the love of Jesus to them when we were with them. It's in his name we pray. Amen. All right. So, so what? Now what? Where did you find yourself in today's story? Maybe you found yourself questioning your commitment to Jesus. How committed are you? Have you found yourself perhaps struggling with unity? Or did Jesus nudge you about maybe something else that needs to change in your life? And I'm curious, do you need help making a plan to walk closer with Jesus? If you do, I would love for you to contact us at steeplelistchurch.com, and we will help you take your next steps. And for those of you who do not yet walk with Jesus, are you ready to be adopted into the family? We have incredible blessings and richness of life. Would you like to share in those blessings? If you would, contact us right now and we will help you take that step. So today we learned how to handle disagreement inside the body of Christ. Next week, we're going to learn about one of the most surprising developments in the entire book of Acts. So make sure you do are with us next week. Thank you for being part of the Steeplest Church family. We love you, and we'll see you next week.